welcome to Harlow on Healthcare. I'm David Harlow, and I invite you to join me by my virtual hearth as I sit down with healthcare leaders to discuss building the future of healthcare. Today, my guest is Megan Ranney, MD, MPH, who is an emergency physician, a researcher, and a national advocate for innovative approaches to public health. She's a professor at the Alpert Medical School at Brown University and is the founding director of the Brown Lifespan Center for Digital Health. Megan's research focus is on developing, testing, and disseminating digital health interventions to prevent violence and mental illness. She's active in leadership roles in national organizations, including as chief research officer of Affirm Research, the country's leading nonprofit committed to ending the gun violence epidemic, through a nonpartisan public health approach, and president of the board of GetUsPPE.org, a startup nonprofit that's delivering donated PPE to those who need it most. She is working on the front lines, seeing COVID patients in the ED on a regular basis, and is an active voice in the public health policy and strategy conversation. You can hear and see her not only right here, but also all across the mainstream media. Welcome, Megan, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me on. It's a joy to be here. So, Megan, you recently attended President Joe Biden's inauguration. I am a professional cynic, but also a sentimentalist. I know I had mixed emotions as I watched him take the oath of office on TV. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit of what it felt like to be there in person. So I'm not usually a big fan of pomp and circumstance. Uh, i be honest, I don't normally watch inaugurations on TV. So I didn't expect to be as moved as I was to be there. I mean, I was so touched to be invited, and it seemed like it was important not just for me, but for the healthcare profession, um, for me to be able to attend. I was honored by my representatives, Representative Langevin's invitation. But honestly, David, the pomp and circumstance took on such deeper meaning than I had anticipated. Every moment of that day, ranging from the singing of the Star Spangled Banner and the Pledge of Allegiance with a speaker who used ASL, right through Vice President Kamala Harris and President Biden taking the oath of office, just took on such importance in light of the year that we've been through. It was a testament to the survival of American democracy and to the value um, of having these pomp and circumstance events. It was also a deep assertion of hope for our country, the value of science public health and healthcare was mentioned throughout the day. And I think it really culminated in many ways in in Amanda Gorman's poem, reminding us that history will have its eyes on what we're doing right now. Right. And that was so powerful. And you're alluding to this already, but I think you see the opportunity for the change in direction for the country generally, and perhaps more specifically, a change in direction in how we are dealing with COVID. And I know you're on the front lines treating COVID patients in the ER and also advocating for changes in the way we as a nation are implementing testing, vaccination, other strategies that are needed. We're a year into this pandemic and has anything gone right at this point? And if you were in charge, what are the handful of top priorities that you would single out as things that need to be changed? You know, how how would that play out in an ideal world? Well, I think inauguration went mostly right. We had testing, we were outside, everyone was masked and distanced for the most part. But outside of that, there's not a lot, honestly, that's gone right in our country in the last year. And the little glimmers of hope have been things that have been done either by individual states or by entrepreneurial citizens. I look at the work of the COVID tracking project, the work of Get Us PPE, which is the nonprofit, as you mentioned, that I helped found that has collected data on needs for personal protective equipment across the country to equitably distribute donated PPE. I look at the work of West Virginia in distributing vaccines quickly. These have been small innovations and drives to do the right thing, but as a country, we have not had a lot of success. If I could wave a magic wand, it would be the same things that we've been asking for since the beginning. It would be about having adequate testing and tracing. 
to allow us to isolate folks before they infect others. It would be about having universal masking for the public and adequate access to personal protective equipment for both healthcare providers, but also other frontline essential workers who are exposed uh, by being in indoor spaces. And now it would also be about vaccine distribution. And underneath it all, of course, would have to lie a terrific interoperable data infrastructure that allows us to know what's needed by whom and to get it to the right people at the right time. Every step of the pandemic has been plagued by a lack of accurate data about what's going on, which then makes it impossible to create um, thoughtful solutions. The last thing, if I could wave a magic wand, would be a strong and consistent public health messaging system. We've lacked transparency, we've lacked accuracy, we've had tremendous public conflict about what's real and what's not. And I think that that has just really hurt our ability to move forward during this pandemic. And we're not going to stop transmission, but reduce it. When we have folks unsure who to believe or what to believe, you know, we default to doing what seems right for our family in the moment, uh, which sometimes is very much, unfortunately, the wrong thing. Right. We are all focused on the issues right in front of us. And yes, that sometimes means we lose perspective. But this has been a year of fighting fires and things that are just right in front of us. Uh, Exactly right. uh, I think you're focusing on a couple of things that have been top of mind for me over time as well in terms of public health messaging and messaging about and administering testing, vaccination etc. And we need to take stock of what we've seen and what we've learned over the past year and think about planning uh, for the future. And I guess the question is, what happens in a post-COVID world? So in addition to dealing with the crisis, what happens after the crisis has passed? How does this change us in a fundamental way? People talk about the new normal. I I prefer to think about the next normal because it keeps changing. What what are the priorities from a public health, public health strategy perspective for preparing for a post-COVID next normal? I think there are really two ways that we can go. There's the cynical, we're just going to go back to normal. We're going to emerge from the pandemic, forget all of the horrors that we've seen in the last year, all of the ways in which the band-aids have been pulled off of the sores of our healthcare and public health system. And we're going to brush it under the table and life will go on. And then the next pandemic or epidemic will hit and we'll go through all of this again. That's the cynical perspective. The more optimistic perspective is that we'll look and say, wow, we saw with such clarity what went wrong. We saw that the lack of unified data hurt our ability to identify not just how many people were getting sick and dying, but who was most at risk and hurt our ability to develop effective public health interventions. And we'll create a lovely data infrastructure, at least for public health purposes. And maybe I could even dream that we'll get to that interoperability that we all would love to see. I could imagine a world in which we say, We've seen the value of telehealth and digital health during this pandemic. You know, my own group, we're emergency medicine, but we've developed a a telecare program for the first time during the pandemic. It has been lovely. I've been able to triage patients with COVID over the phone or over um, video. Uh, We've been able to recommend some digital health interventions to many of them. I would love to see that hold on and get amplified and get good quality Uh, telehealth and digital health solutions in place for all, Um, not just for those who are kind of upper middle class and already accessing it, but for our our more at risk or often forgotten citizens. And I would love to see us think strategically about how to be prepared. You know, again, if you had asked me a year and a half ago, I would never have said that I was going to be working in the supply chain uh, for PPE. (laughs) But I have learned so much over the last year about the value, again, of kind of data and predictive analytics, the thing that I use in public health every day, but also the value of these public-private partnerships and domestic manufacturing. And I think if we really want to take away lessons from this, it's about building up our local infrastructure so that we don't get flat, caught flat-footed again. Our biggest successes during this pandemic came from infrastructures that were already in place, alliances that already existed or 
scientific breakthroughs that had already happened that we were able to maximize. And our biggest failures came because we didn't have a strategic national stockpile that was adequately stocked. We didn't have domestic manufacturing for PPE or good kind of testing, um, uh, kind of upscaling facilities. And if we really want to take this on, we have to address that and build up that basic public health infrastructure. My dream, David, was is that we would do something like the Work Progress Administration that Roosevelt put in place after the Great Depression, but do it for public health and do it in a way that addresses these structural inequities that, again, have been just absolutely highlighted. They were there all along, but we've seen them in such vivid color um, during this pandemic. Absolutely. I have a background in public health as well, and sort of looking at this from a public health perspective, in addition to looking at this from a clinical and and health system perspective is critical, in in my opinion. So I'll agree with you there. Yeah. And I love that point, David, that it is really about tying together the clinical and the public health. I think for the last couple of decades, they've been kind of separated, right? You think of public health as being just about vaccines or sanitation. It's not thought of as being generally particularly interesting or motivating for for many, although those of us that work in it would disagree. Mm -hmm. And then there's the clinical side, which is about, you know, the time sensitive conditions and solving the problems as they occur. I think that this moment with COVID gives us a chance to reintegrate the two, to talk about the way that prevention and public or population health is so much a part of clinical medicine and that we can do a better job with our clinical care if we integrate the principles of public health and population health into it. And so it gives us a chance to rethink the way that we define this in the United States, where we're so focused on that urgent condition. We invest in MRIs and catheterizations and the latest robotic surgeries, but we forget about providing the basics of safe housing and violence prevention and the basic cognitive and emotional skills that help to protect people from getting addicted to opioids, right? There's there's a chance here to rethink things and to look at all that went wrong with COVID and use it as a chance to retool the way that we deliver the full suite of healthcare across the country. If you're just tuning in, this is Harlow on Healthcare coming to you on Healthcare Now Radio. I'm David Harlow and my guest today is Megan Ranney, professor at Brown University School of Medicine. Megan, we're talking a little bit about public health. And I'm wondering if you would say that the pandemic has magnified existing public health problems, or has it magnified issues around social determinants of health? Or is this sort of running in parallel to some of those issues? I think it has magnified our awareness of these issues. They have been there structural racism, income inequality, gender inequality, rural urban divides, those have all been drivers of either good or bad health for decades, if not centuries, um, within our country and elsewhere across the world. They've existed, but we've papered over them. And the pandemic has shown a very bright light on these underlying structural drivers of health status. It is impossible to deny that Black and Brown and Native Americans are getting infected and dying at a greater rate than white Americans. The racism that is inherent to both the way that people experience health and the way that we deliver health care has become something that we can no longer ignore, even if we want to. And so I don't think that the COVID pandemic has created new inequities, but rather it has forced us to confront things that have existed for a very long time. My hope, of course, is that we take this awareness uh, and, and use it for good, use it as a chance to address some of these drivers. And we're seeing that happen in some places. You know, in my own home state of Rhode Island, we're purposely focusing vaccination drives on some of our hardest hit communities. Central Falls, which is a largely immigrant, largely non-white community, was one of the first places that we rolled out vaccines for non-healthcare workers. And that type of attention is a way for us to both address very valid underlying distrust of the healthcare system, but also start to mitigate um, some of these longstanding structural issues. 
one of the things that you've talked about is the digital divide, as we're talking about social determinants of health. And you mentioned that in the context of telemedicine, telehealth, and that's one area, one set of tools that has really been jump-started dramatically during the course of the pandemic. The utilization of telemedicine has just grown astronomically in the past year, which is a good thing. You know, it's too bad that it took something like this for that to happen. There's value to telemedicine, whether or not we're in the midst of a pandemic. And I know you focus some of your work on digital health uh, more broadly, and I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Have you seen opportunities for digital health tools in the course of the pandemic that have not been there earlier? Do you see opportunities for digital health tools in the post-pandemic world that are different than what you might have imagined a year ago? Yeah, so this is one of my favorite topics, both what is possible and the way to do it that can address some of these underlying disparities in our healthcare system and in delivery of health. So the big thing that I've seen is just a dramatic increase in interest in digital health. So many healthcare systems and clinics across the country that had never really kind of taken on telehealth or digital health suddenly had a business imperative to do so because it was the only way to take care of their patients. So we saw many of the things that people thought were barriers to implementing telehealth and digital health suddenly break down. Now, part of that was the business imperative. Part of it, of course, as I know you've discussed before, was the fact that the federal government said, oh, you can do telehealth via Zoom or Skype, right? The, the kind of waive some of the HIPAA requirements. And the fact that this care was now being reimbursed at a rate similar to office visits. I don't know if those are going to stick around or not. And I think that will impact whether telehealth in particular stays, um, but will also impact the long-term uptake of digital health. But what I think we saw even more was that patients were willing to use it and physicians could do it. I think that there are going to be areas where digital health stays. Some of the businesses that I work with through my Center for Digital Health have seen a dramatic increase in contracts during the course of the pandemic. And the businesses that have had the, great, the greatest success have been those working in the areas of substance use treatment, behavioral health, adolescent health, and palliative care. These are things where I see telehealth and digital health sticking around for the long term. I think it's going to be a tougher sell in many aspects of primary care. Um, but what I'm hoping is that we'll see more incorporation of remote monitoring, remote interventions, the things that help individuals to stay healthy in between those little bits of time that they interact with us in the healthcare system. I think the pandemic has reminded many of us in healthcare just how fleeting those moments of contact are and how important it is to contact folks or stay in touch with people in their normal lives in order to facilitate health. The last thing I'll say that I've seen a great surge in interest in during the pandemic that I hope sticks around is, as you said, an attention to these quote-unquote digital divides, which right, any of us that work in digital health know that 95% of Americans have smartphones but you have to develop programs that are usable and accessible to people um, if they're seniors and have need larger print, if they're rural and don't have fast download speeds. So we've seen a greater attention to that during the pandemic, not always with success. The vaccine rollout is a great example of trying to use technology gone wrong. But I, I'm hopeful that that will gain more traction over the months and year to come. And then we'll see a greater suite of products that are directed specifically at those folks that have been left behind or not paid attention to in the digital health world. So we've talked about the digital divide. And I guess the, the follow on to that would be, are there other ways to slice the pie, so to speak? There are myriad apps that are dedicated to certain conditions or certain sets of conditions or issues, and there are others that are just not addressed by digital health. Is that something that's embedded in the nature of digital health tools, or is that the low-hanging fruit? Is, is there more to come? We mentioned behavioral health. That's an issue that's been very significant and magnified through the pandemic as well. Are there other types of issues that are amenable to being dealt with through digital tools that 
haven't been yet? You know, what do you see in your work at the center that may give us a view into the future there? Yeah, so a lot of our work at the center is around behavioral interventions writ large. It's around kind of that question of how do we help the general public to live healthier, not in a wellness way, but in a way that intersects with whatever health issues you have. Whether you're talking about cancer or physical therapy after an orthopedic injury or taking care of yourself after an emergency department visit or making smart decisions about COVID risk assessment and prevention. At the end of the day, it is about kind of that process of integrating knowledge, changing attitudes and norms, and giving folks the cognitive, emotional, and knowledge-based skills to be able to do the thing that will enhance their health. And that's really the big focus. So I think there are lots of areas where digital health can be successfully applied, but what impairs us in the world of digital health is a few things. The first is, as you said, there's this, you know, an app for this, an app for that, an app for kind of the third issue. No person is going to have all of those different apps on their phone and use them regularly. We need to develop an evidence base for what works and then create collections of programs that can be prescribed in connection with each other so that we're not asking either consumers or providers to pick 16 different things out of a hat, but rather that there is a um, unified source of, of digital care and support. The second thing that I think is both a promise and a peril for digital health is the current marketing and, and business model behind it. Some of the most successful products that are out there, particularly in the behavioral health area, have really marketed directly to consumers. And it's been because of failures with the uh, insurance system around mental health care. Uh, that works really well for upper income folks, but is not going to work for our more at risk or vulnerable citizens. And so I think we have to reconceptualize the way that digital health is provided as part of the care system. It's going to be about working with payers or with government, potentially with healthcare systems as well. Um, I don't see long term this being on either consumers or providers to pay for it. And then the third thing is, and I just can't emphasize this enough is the importance of developing products with the voices of both providers, but also the patients front and center throughout the development and assessment process. You can develop something great if you are uh, kind of a person from that population, but if you don't include the voices of the people who you're trying to target, your product is not ultimately going to succeed. And it's why, again, we see Many of the products that have been the greatest business successes so far have been developed by people for people like them. And until we have greater diversity, both in founders and developers of digital health, but again, a centering in the reality of our patients and our general public, we're going to continue to see digital health just be kind of a niche product rather than something that actually transforms the health of Americans. I couldn't agree more. And I would say the the whole sector has really grown up a lot over the past 10 years. And mm -hmm. early on, I, I saw so many founders solving a problem that didn't exist or sort of without a clue coming in from the tech sector and just not understanding healthcare or not understanding a population different from themselves at all. Uh, but that's obviously changed and improved dramatically, but we still have a ways to go. To wrap things up, Megan, I wanted to ask my final question, which is if you were to wake up tomorrow and find yourself five years in the future, what's one thing in healthcare that you would hope or expect to find has changed drastically? I think that our use of technology to liaise with patients and enhance the humanistic side of medicine is going to continue to transform over the next five years. I think that five years from now, we are going to see prescription of apps and wearables, patient use of them and physician comfort with them dramatically different from how it is today. And I think that we're going to be able to use technology in a way that supports patients or the public's conception of themselves as healthy individuals in that full body sense of health, right? Not just physical, but also emotional, mental, social in a very different way. 
And my biggest dream is that that's done in a way that enhances health for all, that has a deep attention to, again, those structural inequities that have plagued our country and certainly our healthcare system for so long. Thank you, Megan. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's a joy to be with you. You have been listening to Harlow on Healthcare. Join us at healthcarenowradio.com. Let's continue the conversation on building the future of healthcare together at hashtag Harlow on HC. I'm David Harlow, keeping the fire going and holding a seat open for you. Until next time. 